In this video, I'm finally going to start the main last topic of the course, the calculus of vector fields. This course is about extending the ideas of derivatives and integrals to multivariable functions. I started with parametric curves, one variable of input, time, and multiple variables of output, positioned in two or three or more dimensional space. Then I went on to scalar fields, multiple variables of input, but only one variable of output. Finally, now I get to talk about vector fields, multiple variables of input and multiple variables of output. So let S be a region in Rn. A vector field is a function on S which has output in some other multidimensional space Rm. A vector field is thought of as attaching a vector, a direction with magnitude, to every point in the domain S. Usually the dimensions are the same, m equals n, but that's not necessary for the definition. A vector field has multiple outputs, m different ones. These are thought of the components as the vector field. They themselves can be thought of as individual functions, f1 up to fm. Each one of the outputs itself is a scalar field. This is great since I can use all that I already know about scalar fields with these component functions, fi. Each of them has one scalar output and multiple inputs, x1 up to xn. To make this slightly more accessible, this is a scalar field from R2 to R2. It takes every point in R2 and assigns to it a unique vector, also in R2. Every point gets an arrow. The components are F1 and F2, which are two scalar fields on R2. Together, they give the vector output. Similarly, here is the general form of a vector field in R3. It has three inputs, the position variables x, y, and z, and it has three outputs, the component functions f1, f2, and f3, each of which is a scalar field on R3. It attaches a three-dimensional arrow with direction and magnitude to every point of R3. There are two major interpretations I'm going to rely on. The first is fluid dynamics, currents in the air or in the water. To understand how air or water moves, I can attach a vector to each point in the air or in the water. That arrow is the direction and speed of the movement at that point. The movement can be quite complicated. In a windstorm, various locations have different wind speeds and directions. Putting an arrow at each point gives me enough information to describe all of this movement. Fluid dynamics is based on understanding the vector fields that describe the movement of liquids or gases. The second major interpretation is as an expression of force. The force of gravity due to the Earth acting on any object above the Earth. This action is a force. It has a direction and a magnitude and it is best described by a vector field, since a vector field can assign to every point a direction and a magnitude. The ambient force of gravity is a vector field. And this is similar for forces of electricity and magnetism. These are also vector fields in a region acting on any electrically or magnetically charged object in that region, pushing it in some direction with some strength, magnitude and direction. Let me get to some visuals. Here is a vector field where every point in R2 is assigned the vector 0, 1, the vector that points straight up. This is a constant vector field. The same vector is assigned to every point. As a fluid flow, this is a uniform flow in one direction, in this case the positive y direction. There's no turbulence here, no vortices or spinning, just moving uniformly all at the same rate, all in a single direction. As a field of force, this is a force that acts to push anything in the positive y direction, and it's the same force everywhere. No matter where an object is placed, it will feel the same force upon it, pulling it upwards. This is another constant vector field. To each point in R2, I attach the vector 1 tenth, 1 half. This is a slightly tilted direction compared to the previous field. The directions are still mostly in the positive y direction, but also a little bit in the positive x. As a fluid flow, this is again a uniform flow, but now in a slightly diagonal direction. As a field of force, any object in the field will be accelerated in this slightly diagonal direction as well. Here is a more complicated field. This field is defined for R3, but I've only drawn a two-dimensional slice of it here. All the vectors point towards the origin, 
And the closer I get to the origin, the larger the vectors become. But each point is still given a direction and a magnitude. This is a vector field. As a fluid flow, this is some kind of drain, though without any spinning or whirlpool dynamics. Everything is going towards the origin and is getting faster the closer it gets. Far away, the effect is minimal, but the fluid accelerates as it gets closer to the origin, getting pulled into some sort of hole, maybe a black hole. As a force, this is a perfect representation of gravity. From the mg in the equation, you might have actually guessed that this is exactly the field due to gravitational source of mass capital M, where g is the gravitational constant. Gravity is stronger the closer an object is to the gravitational source, so the vectors have greater magnitude near the origin. Gravity becomes minimal at great distance, hence the smaller vectors further out. So this is a great picture of the force of gravity as a vector field. That's the definition of a vector field and some initial examples. Before finishing this video, let me talk about basic properties. Vector fields output vectors, so any operation that can happen on vectors can happen on vector fields. Vector has length, so I can ask for the length of a particular vector field. This looks at all of the vectors attached to all the points in the domain and asks for all of their lengths, all infinitely many vectors. The result is a scalar field, since the length of a vector is a scalar. I can ask for the unit direction of a vector field. At every point, this calculates the vector divided by its length, as long as that length is not zero, giving a vector of length one, and this captures the direction at each point while ignoring the magnitude. If I have two vector fields, I can add or subtract them, since vectors can be added or subtracted. And if I have two vector fields, I can take the dot product. This looks at every point in the domain, finds the vectors that f and g attach to that point, and takes their dot product to output a scalar, so f dot g is a scalar field built out of two vector fields. It does all the things that dot product usually does. It can be used to find the angles between two vector fields to determine if two vector fields are parallel or perpendicular to each other. If lowercase f is a scalar field, then the output of lowercase f is a scalar and uppercase f is a vector field at all points in the domain. Therefore, I can do scalar multiplication. Multiply the output of little f by the vector large f everywhere. And finally, if f and g are vector fields in R3, I can take their cross product. This produces another vector field which is perpendicular to both of the original vector fields at all of the points where they're defined. The key idea in all of these constructions is that a vector field gives a vector at each point, and then I can do vector operations at each point. Therefore, I can do vector operations on the vector fields as a whole, doing everything point by point.